Good evening and welcome to the seating and selection show for the Rudy's Real Texas Barbecue State Volleyball Championships. This is where we announce the teams and matchups and break down the bracket a little bit. But before we get started, how about a little roll call? I know the St. Pius Sartans are out there watching. The Artesia Bulldogs have a little get together down south. Hatch Valley. Yeah, I, I see you out there. Tularosa. You are on the reservation list as well. We have your table just about ready, so be patient. Floyd is checking this one out to see where they fit in. St. Michael's and Socorro, thanks for both joining us on this one. I know they're both excited. David Martin and the Onyate Knights told us they are out there watching. I'll bet they're anxious to see where they land. The Portales Rams are having a party. Why wasn't I invited? Well, enjoy it without me. I had to be here and deliver all the news, right? Remember, this is a new format this year. There's no more pool play in this tournament. This is a double elimination bracket. Also, on Championship Saturday, there will be multiple title games being played at the same time to create more of a festive environment and atmosphere. Should be a lot of fun. You are all watching this show to find out who's in, what seed you got, who you'll play. But before we get to that, let's review the seeding process so there's no confusion. The following criteria is used to determine a team's seed. This criteria was voted on by the member schools. We look at finish in regular season district play, head-to-head -head matchups, wins against district championship teams regardless of class, overall record, max preps rankings, and member school input. That's the coach's input and ranking. There is no input given by the NMAA. Everyone say it with me now. I'm listening. No input by the NMAA. It's all data driven. There is no bias for or against any school or team. You may have seen the instructional video demonstrating the entire process, so there should be no confusion on how your school received the seating they did. The process is spelled out with the criteria points that was voted on by the member schools. Now, this is also important. Everyone listen up. Volleyball has been a 12 team bracket for over 10 years now. The, the coaches asked to go to 12 teams, and it's been that way for a while. Since there are only 12 slots, some teams might be on the outside looking in. A team with, let's say, a higher max preps ranking or coach's input might not make it into the bracket if another team earned an automatic spot by winning their district or winning their district tournament. Does that make sense? Sometimes there are only so many seats at the table, right? Well, let's get to it. Enough of my talking about the introduction and the seating criteria and everything. You're here to see the brackets, right? Well, we will start with class 1A and the top team is Melrose. They were last year's state runner-up and come into the tournament this year with a perfect 19-0 record led by head coach Casey Jackson. Last year, Melrose was just two points shy of lifting the state volleyball championship for the second straight year. So two points has been their battle cry, Melrose hasn't lost since that match. This year's Melrose squad has five returning starters from last season and seven more who saw significant playing time. A lot of them have been playing varsity since the eighth grade or freshman year, so they have plenty of experience there. Let's look at the top four in this class who all get a first round bye. The two seed is, Mel is the Melrose rival Logan, then it's Pine Hill and Kamado. These teams will not play their first game until Thursday afternoon. Now, Pine Hill is one of those teams making some noise this year. They come into the tournament with an eye-popping 20-1 record, the best in school history. We feel like this is our best team, and this is our chance. Pine Hill volleyball coach Carlette Daniels has reason to be optimistic. The Warriors put together their best season ever. This season has been amazing and it's been fun and it's been challenging. From like last year to this year, it's kind of a cool transformation. They come into the state tournament with one of the best records of any team in any class. This year we're, we're expected to be there. Um, we want that and um, we, we went on the drought for about 20 years from our last uh, district championship and we won one last year. With more wins and more success comes even more fan support. It's honestly kind of like cool. It's like amazing. The, the community is excited. Um, we, we generally had our, our big, uh, our fan base was in basketball. And so we're starting to have people follow us in volleyball and um, it, it's something that's be excited for. Last season, Pine Hill reached the state tournament and picked up a first round win but lost in the quarterfinals. We have a lot of girls on the team that were there with us last year at state. And so when we get there this year, I think we kind of just know how to put it together more. And so I think we'll be better prepared to maybe go on to the next round 
or go even further. We're talking about grades, we're talking about practice, we're talking about all those little things um, to help us so we can focus and, and, and maybe be, um, do well at the state tournament. Watch out for Pine Hill. They just might surprise some people. Now let's take a look at the rest of the bracket. Kara Zozo and Evangel Christian will square off in the opening round with the winner moving on to meet Melrose. Floyd is the five against Santa Fe Waldorf. Tatum is six and we'll see Cimarron in the opening round. Fort Sumner is seven and Des Moines the 10 seed. Let's break down a couple things. Santa Fe Waldorf, Des Moines, they both earned automatic spots as regular season district champs. Now Cimarron won the district tournament. So Santa Fe Waldorf, Des Moines, and Cimarron all get into the field. That leaves one last spot between Evangel Christian and Animus. Let's compare these two based on the criteria. Evangel Christian was higher in Max Prep's rankings. Animus was higher in the coach's input. Evangel Christian had the better overall record. District finish was even. Neither had wins against district champs or head-to-head -head. So Evangel Christian was better than Animus by a score of two to one in the criteria voted on by the member schools. So Evangel Christian gets in ahead of Animus. Moving on to class 2A, it shouldn't be much of a surprise. The Texco Wolverines are number one. They've won state titles in each of the last five years. Head coach Kristen Scanlon has that program running like clockwork. They are riding a nine match win streak. Texaco is number one. Here's a look at the first four. Dulce is the two seed. Hagerman earned a three and Pecos is four. Pecos only has four losses on the year, but three of them are a top seed Texaco. Now getting back to Dulce, Dulce reached the state final last season for the first time in school history. They are hoping this year to take one more step and claim that top prize. In 2018, the Dulce volleyball program made school history, reaching the state final for the first time ever. We still have that dream to get into that championship game this year, and, and the dream is to win it, not come in second. Dulce lost to eventual state champ Texaco, but the Hawks returned virtually everyone from last year's runner-up team. We're kind of small, but we're strong. When like we're all doing our job on the court, we're, we're pretty special. Dulce is having a great season, and the experience of last year's state tournament should help them this time around. It showed us like what to expect. Um, like seeing the teams that, like how hard they work just to get there, we're, we're capable of doing the same as them. We have experience, so we know what to expect now. So we won't be so like nervous or we won't, we'll be ready. They actually feel how it is to win and to feel the praise and the love and just the support that our community has been giving them since end of last season. Kathleen Salazar Valdez is in her 17th year as head coach. She describes this team as smart and quick with some power. And that's where senior middle hitter Caitlin Duncan comes in. She has so much hang time that she could look everywhere on the court before she could make the choice of where, what she wants to do. When we travel, Young, young ladies seek her out. So it's just awesome to see that, you know, they're more role models now and it, it's great that little girls come up and ask for autographs or just ask to hold her towel. It's just so cute and it's, it's something I wanted for my program. You know, more role models and, and supporting the youth. Could this be the year for Dulce? What would it mean to finally lift that blue trophy? That would be something. Be the first ever to do it. I would. That'd be literally a dream come true. If these girls go and play and bring that blue trophy back, it'll mean everything. I may even resign. <laughs> End on a high note. <laughs> Here's the bracket for Class 2A. Monte del Sol and Penasco will go head-to-head -head on the opening day of the tournament. Mescalero is the five and will take on Estancia. Coronado is a six and will meet Magdalena. Eunice is a seven going up against Desert Academy. Now, Estancia earned their spot with a district tournament championship win. Desert Academy was a regular season district champ after winning their playoff. So those were two automatic spots in the bracket. Cloudcroft and Santa Rosa didn't get in because of some of those other automatic qualifiers we talk about. Again, only 12 spots in the bracket. Class 3A, you are up next. The top honor goes to the Tularosa Wildcats. Tularosa racked up a nice 19-2 record this season. They lost some seniors last year and weren't sure how this season would shake up. But 
turned out well enough to earn a number one seed. Honestly, I was a little worried, but after July and seeing what, what happened in July in the preseason, um, I knew that we were gonna, we were gonna be all right. <laughs> it's been a lot better than expected, honestly. Losing those seniors, we didn't think we were gonna be as good as we were last year, but honestly, we excited, ex exceeded many expectations, and I think we're honestly more competitive than we were last year. Last year's team, we were good, but we didn't play as well together as this year's team does. Um, we had very talented girls last year, but we are just as talented this year, and I feel like we can go farther than we ever have. Here's a look at the top four teams. Robertson is the two seed, Hatch Valley the three, and St. Michael's the four. I know those watch parties just got a little loud, right? Hope you're taking a picture of the screen with your phone to document the moment. If you didn't, get out your phone, get ready, I'll tell you when to snap. Ready, and take the picture of the screen now. Go ahead, yep, now you can capture that moment forever. Let's take a look at the rest of the brackets. Socorro is the eight, Tucum carry the nine. Those two face each other. Sandia Prep is a five seed, going up against Dexter. Laguna Acoma, the six, and Santa Fe Indian School, the 11. Those two teams meet, and the winner will take on Hatch Valley. Robertson will await the winner of Navajo Prep and Santa Fe Prep. Only two more classes to go. Are you getting excited? Class 4A, the top honor goes to the St. Pius Sartans. They are led by head coach Jordan Russell and are 18-2. and two. Their only setbacks were against Cibola and La Cueva. The Sartans won it all in 2016. Is there pressure being number one again? I don't know if it puts a target on us, but it does. We've changed uh, our mentality to you have a responsibility rather than pressure. It's just responsibility to, you know, step up to the plate and really show what we've shown all season um, and not let it go at the end of the year. So we're our big word this year is responsibility to get things done. <laughs> I have uh, three seniors right now that started with me as sophomores and they've been through that pain and, and heartbreak that we've had the past two years. And so they just... Uh, they stepped into tryouts with a new new mindset and really saying like we're going to get it done because this is what we want to leave our legacy at Pius. Who else earned a buy with St. Pius? How about Goddard, Artesia, and Portalis? They all put together good resumes and earned a top four spot. They won't play until the first round sorts itself out. So who's playing in the first round, JP? Well, glad you asked. That's an excellent question. Why don't I show you? Silver and Hope, you are in the field. Academy is the five against Los Lunas, the final team in the field. More on that in just a moment. Santa Teresa is a six seed, Miyamura the 11. Los Alamos and Powake square off with the winner getting Goddard. Now, let's take a look at that last spot, the 12 seed. It came down to a three-team race between Kirtland Central, Moriarty, and Los Lunas. The reason was Kirtland Central beat Moriarty 3-2 in the criteria points. Los Lunas beat Kirtland Central 3-2 in criteria points, but Moriarty beat Los Lunas 2-1 in criteria points. So you see where it gets a little tricky, right? Again, this is for the last spot in this bracket. So let me break this down criteria point by criteria point. I hope this makes sense. In a three-way tie, when we break this down, the lowest point total in the end will earn the final spot. It's a three-way tie, so when we break down each criteria, we have to rank those teams one, two, and three. Let's start with coach's input. Kirtland Central was 15, and Los Lunas and Moriarty finished tied at 12 in the coach's input. So, you see, coaches, those forms make a difference. So Los Lunas and Moriarty each get a point and a half, and Kirtland Central gets three. The point and a half is the average of one and two points. Does that make sense? Next is the Max Preps ranking. Moriarty was 11, Los Lunas 13, and Kirtland Central 14 in the Max Preps ranking. So we give Moriarty one point, Los Lunas two points, and Kirtland Central three points. Now, on to district finish. Kirtland Central and Los Lunas finished second in their district. Moriarty finished third. So we give Kirtland Central and Los Lunas one and a half points each, and Moriarty gets three points. On to overall record. Kirtland Central's win percentage was 700, so they get one point. Moriarty was 609, so they get two points. And Los Lunas was 565. Their win percentage was 565, so they get three points. Next is wins against district champs. Kirtland Central had two wins against a district champ. They get one point. Los Lunas and Moriarty each had one, 
So we give them two and a half points each. Lastly is head to head. Kirtland Central had a loss against Los Lunas and Moriarty didn't play the others. So Los Lunas gets one point, Moriarty gets two points and Kirtland Central three points. Now you add up all those points Kirtland Central has 12 and a half points, Los Lunas with 11 and a half points, and Moriarty with 12 points. As I said earlier, the team with the lowest point total on a three-way tie would be the winner. So Los Lunas earned the last spot in the Class 4A bracket. I know that might sound a little confusing, but it all comes down to the numbers on those criteria points that were voted on by the coaches. Last but not least, Class 4 5A, the top team in this bracket is the defending state champ, La Cueva. The Bears come into this one with an 18-1 record. They've only lost one match in the past two years, and that was this year's season opener against Cibola. In fact, talk about dominating. La Cueva has swept their last 11 opponents, 3-0 in all of them. Here are the top four who get a bye. Centennials, the two. Cibola, the three. Volcano Vista, the four. As I mentioned earlier, Cibola is the only team to beat the Bears this year. Centennial was in the title game in 2017. They are 21-2 this year. The bracket a lot of you have been waiting for. Cleveland and Onyate is the 8-9 matchup. Santa Fe is the 5 going up against Hobbs. Las Cruces, you are the 6 and will face Roswell in the opening round. Sandia is the 7 going up against El Dorado. Now, a little explanation on this bracket. Hobbs was a regular season district champ. Roswell was a district tournament champ, so they both earned a spot in the field. That left the last slot between El Dorado and Manzano. El Dorado finished higher in coaches' input. Manzano was higher in the Max Preps rankings. El Dorado had a better finish in district and in wins against district champs. The overall record was a push and they did not play head-to-head, -head, so El Dorado wins on criteria points by a 3-1 count. The Eagles are in, and the Monarchs did not make the field this year. Even though Manzano beat Hobbs and Roswell in criteria points, Hobbs and Roswell get an automatic spot, as I mentioned. So that's how it breaks down in this bracket. Hope that all makes sense. Good luck to all the teams in the field. Remember, it's a double elimination format, no pool play this year, and it all starts on Thursday in Rio Rancho at the Santa Ana Star Center. Thanks for watching our show. Remember to compete with class, and we'll see you on the court.